Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. They know the ins and outs of everywhere we're going. They will protect you. Horses, run! And they just like, <laughs> but block. I was like, what? <laughs> I feel like I got a great break on a used car. <laughs> I, I, I thought that, was, <laughs> that was a great, great quote. <laughs> this is war, Marcus. He's going to the bathroom. Are you in his house, you little psycho? <laughs> Look, get, the, get out of there. Look, it's a giant womb. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Butler. And I'm Mike Field. And you're listening to the Forgotten Cinema Podcast. Each episode, we highlight a film that for a variety of reasons was forgotten by audiences. Whether it be because a more popular movie was released at the same time, or the film simply didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the movie, or maybe don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit it. You never know, you might find your own forgotten gem. If you enjoy our podcast, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. Yo, what's going on? Nothing much, you know. Just, you know, getting divorced, getting taught how to be a real man, <laughs> then deciding I want to be the, the, the lame guy I was before, because that was actually who I really was and who my wife fell in love with. I just stopped trying. Interesting. Yeah, uh, the usual. Why, 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 what movie are you talking about? We're talking about 2011's Crazy Stupid Love. Well, why don't you tell us what Crazy Stupid Love is about? Well, as soon as I get the synopsis up that I deleted for some reason. <laughs> Cal Weaver is living the American dream. He has a good job, a beautiful house, great children, and a beautiful wife named Emily. Cal's seemingly perfect life unravels, however, when he learns that Emily has been unfaithful and wants a divorce. Over 40 and suddenly single, Cal is adrift in the fickle world of dating. Enter Jacob Palmer, a self-styled player who takes Cal under his wing and teaches him how to be a hit with the ladies. Eh, I mean, that is technically what happens. That's, <laughs> that's one of many plots. Okay. Right. Well, there are a lot of different threads in this film, so uh, which is part of the reason why I think I enjoyed it. But so Crazy Stupid Love has a runtime of 118 minutes. It's rated R. Production budget of $50 million. Release date was Friday, July 29th, 2011. It's opening weekend. It did $19 million. Domestic 84, worldwide 145. So definitely a hit, which I was actually pleasantly surprised that it did. It made money. Mm, so was I, yeah. It's not, I mean, I wouldn't technically call this a summer film, but what it went up against in terms of counter-programming, I think it probably was a good, a, a good release date. Mm. Uh, so production company was Carousel Productions and Denovi Pictures and then distributed by Warner Brothers. So I said it came out on the 29th. They went up against in a wide release Cowboys and Aliens, Butler's favorite film. Mm. The Smurfs, <laughs> a limited release of Attack the Block and The Devil's Double. Uh, the week after the 5th of August in a wide release, you had Rise of the Planet of the Apes. I like that one. <laughs> the Change Up and then a limited release The Whistleblower. And the week before, the 22nd of July... Uh, you had a wide release of this little film called Captain America, the first Avenger. I don't know if you've heard of that. Nope. <laughs> Friends with benefits. And then a limited release of a little help and another earth. So like I said before, kind of a little cross uh, counter programming against Captain America. Definitely Cowboys and aliens. Those are two action films, even rise of the planet of the apes is an action film. You don't have a, I don't want to say feel good, but a romantic, I wouldn't call this a rom-com per se. Cause I think there's a lot of drama in this. It's a little bit of a drama. Right. Day, so guess, it's yeah. definitely a movie that within these three weeks is there's nothing much like it. The change up is not really like it. the change up is more of a buddy comedy a little bit. Which one is the change? That's when Ryan Reynolds and Jason Bateman switch bodies, switch lives. Oh, okay. Yeah. I remember thinking that was all right. It's all right, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's no, no, it's nothing crazy, like stupid this. Love. Yeah. Right. This film has two directors. It was directed by Glenn Ficarra and John Requa. They have done Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. I love Philip Morris. Focus. And they are also one of the creators of the TV show This Is Us, for those fans out there. Written by Dan Fogelman, who is also the other creator of This Is Us. He's also written for Tangled, uh, Fred Claus, and Life Itself. He also did Gallivant, apparently. Oh, I, don't know. Okay. I loved Gallivant. Was there like, you go. Did you ever watch that? No. Uh, wasn't was into good. it. Cinematographer was Andrew Dunn, who has done The Bodyguard, Practical Magic, and Downton Abbey, A New Era, that just came out. Com two composers, Christoph Beck and Nick Urata. Beck has done a bunch of stuff, but also The Hangover, Frozen, Ant-Man, and Free Guy. And then Urata has done Paddington, ACOD, and The Cobbler. Edited by Lee Haxel, who has done the 2005 Dukes of Hazard. He's also done to Take Me Home Tonight. And the 2018 Overboard, not the original. Take, uh, take Me Home Tonight is the one you like, right? 
I do like Take Me Home tonight. It's actually on our big list, but we have not yet picked it. Uh, produced by Steve Carell and Denise Denovi. Uh, Carell has, I try to find, he's done stuff that he's been in, like he's produced Space Force, but I tried to find something that he had produced that he was not in. Mm-hmm. And but the only one I found was the TV show Angie Tribeca, which is with, oh, she was in the office. She played Karen. Um, I'm blanking on her name. I'm looking right at her face. I can see her face and I'm blanking on it. So, but his carousel production, he is, he runs carousel productions, right? That's I, don't know him. If he, I don't know if he solely does that, but yes, I believe yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, Denise Denovi uh, has produced Little Women, the 2019 one, Ramona and Beezus, and Batman Returns, to name a few. So Steve Carell is also in this film. He plays Cal. He was nominated for an Oscar for the movie. Can you remember? Uh, the one where he's the wrestling coach, yeah, right? Yeah, Foxcatcher. Yes. Uh, he's also obviously on the TV show Space Force and the TV show The Office for anyone out there. He's also in the movie Dan in Real Life, which I really like. Ryan Gosling as Jacob. He was nominated for two Oscars, one for La La Land and Half Nelson. And then he was in Blade Runner 2049 and The Nice Guys, which is an episode we did, Butler. Mm-hmm. Julianne Moore, who plays Emily. You know how many Oscars she was nominated for? A uh, bunch. How many? Can, uh, can you guess? I can't remember. I read the note. Six? Five. Five. Okay. And she's won one. So she won for Still Alice. Uh, she was nominated for Far From Heaven, The Hours, The End of the Affair, and Boogie Nights. Emma Stone plays Hannah. She is an Academy Award winner for La La Land. She was also nominated for The Favorite and Birdman. Leo Tippin, I don't know if that's how you say her name, plays Jessica. She's in Lucy, Two Night Stand, and the TV show Why Women Kill, a couple of episodes there. Jonah Bobo plays Robbie, who's in Zathura, Choke, and he's the TV show, he's the voice of Austin on the TV show The Backyardigans, for fans out there. Joey King plays Molly. Molly and Robbie are the children of Cal and Emily. There's also, obviously, Hannah is also there, but that's the reveal towards the end. But anyways, Joey King is in the TV show Fargo. She's in, or She was in the... F- First season or second season? She's in Ramona Beezus, White House Down, and Bullet Train, the upcoming. That's that's a new movie, Butler, with uh, Brad Pitt. Marissa Tomei plays Kate Butler. Do you know how many Oscars she was nominated for? Two? Three. Three. And wow, she won. Okay. You know, she, she won, won for My Cousin Vinny. She's won, yep. She was a winner for My Cousin Vinny. She was also nominated for The Wrestler and In the Bedroom. And she's also the updated Aunt May in the new Spider-Man trilogy. She was the updated Aunt May. <laughs> oh, spoiler. Beth Littleford as Claire. Uh, she is in Mystery Alaska, Drill Bit Taylor, and the TV show Dog with a Blog. John Carroll Lynch is Bernie. Bernie and Claire are the father and mother of Jessica, who is the babysitter for Callan family. That's just, well, just trying to give you a little idea where everyone is. Uh, John Carroll Lynch is in Fargo, the movie. He's also in The Founder, which is an episode we did in the TV show mm-hmm. the, uh, Big Sky. Da- Kevin Bacon is David Linhagen. The evil David Linhagen. Who's in, <laughs> uh, he's in episode we did Story of Echoes. Take. He's in the TV show City on the Hill. Do you remember? Do you know what Kevin Bacon's first film was? Let's see if you can. Oh, it's uh, isn't it uh, Friday the Thirteenth? No, that's a good guess. That's 1980. It's Animal House. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, but that was a good guess. Friday the Thirteenth is probably his third or fourth. Okay. And then Josh Groban's in this. He plays Richard. He plays the drib drab boyfriend of Hannah. He's Andy's brother in the Office. If you ever look at, he's obviously also a famous tenor, a famous yes. singer. So, all right. So we had actually both seen this film. Mm-hmm. Um. And I'm pretty sure we both like it, but what what, what was your, was this your second time seeing it, third time? This is probably my second time seeing it all the way through. Okay. I did catch it once on TV right before the big reveal toward the end. Sure. And I had to just keep watching because I course. love, that scene is awesome. Well, that's one of my favorite scenes <laughs> in the movie. But okay, so I'm curious your thoughts seeing it again. Uh, I still really enjoy it. I love the mix of actual drama and comedy. It doesn't take itself, it, it's called Crazy Stupid Love, but it never gets too stupid to the point where I hate it. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem with a lot of romantic comedies is they do, and they feel disingenuous, and I just don't like them. But I feel like this one keeps its heart on its sleeve while also still being serious and heartfelt. And the comedy doesn't come from stupid gags and stuff like that for the most part. Uh, So I really liked it. I do think the reveal toward the end, that last scene, having seen it a couple times, knowing what's coming up, I think that does take away a little bit of the initial react. I love that scene when I first saw it because you didn't see everything coming. Mm-hmm. And knowing that kind of takes away a little bit from it, but mostly just that scene, not from the way I overall still feel about this film. Well, the the scene in the movie is, is he's talking about it. in in the film uh, when Cal meets Jacob at the bar because you you the whole movie starts off with uh, the dinner that Cal and Emily are having, and she's he's like looking at the menu and he's like, oh, I can't decide what I want for dinner. She's like, I want a divorce, and like so it starts yeah. like that. 
she basically unloads saying that she cheated on him with David Lindhagen, who we don't like. Hagen. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and he just jumps out of the car and, and it's just he basically is like, I'll move out of the house. It's it's it, yeah. you pretty much get the inciting incident as soon as the movie starts. Yep. That starts the this whole uh path and this journey that Cal takes. But what ends up happening is Cal meets Jacob at a bar and Jacob take like in the like I talked about in the synopsis, takes him under his wing. And you get this other subplot of Hannah who is played by Emma Stone. And you said like the whole idea is that Jacob turns Cal into him, but in reality, he wants to be more like Cal. He wants that to be able to be with somebody and not treat women as objects. Jacob's and, and like a stuff. player. Yeah. But right. he secretly wants, you know, he wants what Cal has that, that kind of deep connection. And he finds that with Hannah. Or I don't know if he secretly wants it, but once he well, gets he, it, he says that he realizes him. what he wants. Well, that's what I'm saying. He says but, that. But he, to him. No, what he says to him, I used to think that was a weakness. And right. I got it. And right. I, you know, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's another thing is you get that uh, nice scene between him and Hannah where he admits why he's like that. And I like that you get a little well, bit of that without when they don't sleep crazy. together. Right. And he explains what his parents were like. Yeah. Right. Right. You get all that. But you get these storylines separate. You don't uh, you don't understand how they connect. You only think the connection is Jacob and Cal. And then right. you find out at the end of the film that he's going to meet her mother. And it's uh, Jake. Hannah is actually Cal and Emily's daughter. Because they got married when they're really young, like she got pregnant when she was seventeen. This is Emily, so yep. it's it's a so it's a whole scene. Like he does not want her dating his daughter. It's funny. It's really funny. it's great. It's a really good moment. Um, so that's the scene he's talking about. We we can we can get into that a little bit later if you want. I wanted to ask you that. Um, Steve Carell hates the title of this film. He he, he I saw that he doesn't like it. Uh, and go ahead. You mentioned about the iPad. So they had a a contest. We mentioned this off air. Uh, but I guess they had a contest um, while they were filming the movie and any member of the production that could name the movie would get a free iPad, basically. Yeah, you came up, up come with the title, title of the yeah. movie. Now, I don't know who came up with this title. Carell preferred the title Wingman, which he, he admitted he, was boring. The option was apps. the Wingman, yeah. Uh, but I think the Wingman kind of... The Wingman makes it assume like it's a a buddy comedy and it's it just denotes to me, like in my mind, a stupid buddy comedy. Right. It, it, it's, it, yeah, it, it seems like it would be something that you, what you wouldn't expect to what you got in the yeah, film. Yeah. A little it's called the wingman. lower brow than this, well, maybe. Well, that's the other thing. You call it the wingman, and then immediately, you're like, okay, so Cal and Jacob are the leads, and you're just counting Emily, you're just counting Hannah, you're just counting all the, the female leads in this movie. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that kind of like, that's, that's not what you want going in. The working title for this was Untitled Marital Crisis Comedy. <laughs> I could have just kept that. But I kind of like that title. I don't mind this. I don't mind this comedy. No, it's, it's this it title. Works. It's fine. It's it's you know it's it's about all over the place. But the whole movie's all over the place in terms of just life and yeah everything that happened. And there are now I don't watch This Is Us. I'm not a big fan of This Is Us. Uh, my fiance did at least watch the first season. Yeah. I've watched a couple of, I don't know if this is the same, no. like you're getting the same stuff. This is us is very serious, very yeah. dramatic, over dramatic. So I don't, I appreciate the lightheartedness in this movie. Um, even though some of the subject matter in terms of the divorce and the kid and, and, um, you know, the stuff that him and Cal are doing, Jacob and Cal are doing I, even though that's a little bit, you know, on the serious side, I still like the lighthearted stuff. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But I don't. I wouldn't call this a rom com. I would call this a romantic drama. Maybe. I think um, I would say that. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I like dramedy, but <laughs> but that the dramedy word. But dramedy also kind of denotes maybe darker subject matter as well. Mm -hmm. Usually, so. So a couple other facts, real quick. The original release date was the twenty second, so they obviously pushed it back into the summer. It was the twenty second of April, right? So they obviously. Left left the spring and went into the summer. I don't know why, but maybe because we talked about counter programming. The actual script that um, Fogelman wrote was purchased for two point five million dollars, and then it was a it was a blacklist script. It was on the two thousand ten blacklist. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. If you're, un if you're unfamiliar with the blacklist, it was it, what blacklist used to be was scripts that were that read really well that people really liked, but they were not getting made. So they were highlighting scripts that maybe fell through the cracks. Yeah. So this was one of them. Saw it, picked up, Corral read it, and he wanted to do it. And just uh, for some reason, I was able to get this DVD sales of this film was 19.8 million and Blu ray sales were 5.6 million. Um, I quite, quite honestly, I don't know how that relates to other properties. This is one of the first ones <laughs> where they gave us that note. Right. Well, I had that last week. I think we did the DVD. You've note. had that a couple of times. Yeah, but often. I just don't know how to judge that. I was honestly. surprised it was so low. I would think it'd be higher. I always think of DVD sales and Blu ray sales as being higher than the film itself. See, crazy. This type of movie is a type of movie that would have probably would have long legs 
uh, if it was on like like TNT did the classics or the new classics, like if it was uh, it on, on TV. the TV, yeah. kept seeing it. This this is the type of film that would. I think if people saw and they're like, oh, what's this? And they started watching, they wouldn't stop watching. Yeah. That was rated R, so there's stuff that's going to get cut out. But I, I think that's this type of film would probably have more legs than maybe we're saying it did because of that, because of just access to it. Yeah. You know, this isn't something that I think a lot of people are going to cycle through on HBO Max or Prime or something like that. Oh, let's watch this. I don't think they're they're thinking about finding this film. Sure. It is on Netflix until June 30th. So by the time I, I watched it on out, HBO Max. It's on HBO. Oh, is it? Yeah. That's probably why it's leaving Netflix. I also own this film. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want, wait, wait. Did you watch it on Netflix? You didn't. You I didn't watched put, it on Netflix. You didn't put your DVD or Blu ray in? Because at least has a DVD. So the, the quality is going to be worse than oh, uh, Netflix. Oh, my goodness. How about that Blu ray life, man? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where do you want to go from here? What would you like to talk about first? You want to go through the characters? Yeah, we could do that. We, we usually say that for the, the end. But yeah, we could talk about that. Well, who do you want to start off with? Jacob, Cal. I guess we can start off with Cal. I mean, he's our main. What do you think? I think he's okay. I think he's very similar to his character from, and this is something I got, especially this time watching it, from uh, Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. Mm-hmm. He's very similar to that character. Just that that kind of dour moodiness? The dour moodiness, the kind of meek guy who is a great guy, but doesn't fight for anything, doesn't really push for anything. Mm-hmm. I, I think they're very similar characters, and I think maybe... That's kind of pigeonhole. I mean, Steve Crow's had a great career, but I think that kind of like that's his guy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of similar to Dan in the real life. Dan in the real like life, that. I like, like though. It's it's all very similar to all that. I mean, I like seeking a friend for the underworld. I don't think I'd ever watch it again because it's super, super depressing. Uh, but <laughs> I, I think he plays a lot of similar characters. But I think he plays this well, and I think the they do a good job on his transition from Cal at the beginning to Cal after he meets and learns from Jacob and gets confidence. Cal when his hair is unkempt and then Cal when he has a hair, his hair combed back. Yes. And his, <laughs> eye, his eyes don't have ball sacks. I'm wondering <laughs> if they did some prosthetic work there or they must the, have because he, he doesn't have it after. And he was, re- and he was really, um, he was really puffy in the face a little bit in the, I think he gained, had weight at the beginning and maybe lost. And they had, I mean, but that's like, he only had the scenes so that he like had weight. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I like Steve Carell. I think he's hilarious in The Office. He, I know he's awkward. I know you don't like awkward comedy, but he's really awkward. I like that. him in The Office. I maybe. wasn't a huge Space Force guy. I'm not. A, I didn't find it funny. At least the first couple episodes of the first season. So I, I heard I just, it was bad. I, never I bagged out of it. Um, but I don't know how I feel about him in this type of role. I'm not really. It's like I can see dozens of other people in this film. Okay. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't think that's a knock. I just don't. It wasn't a role that I was. This Steve Crook is the only person that could have played this. And maybe that's true of a lot of things. Maybe I'm just being. Who would you have put in this? I don't. I don't really have an answer you to that. Say anybody else. I just don't know how I, I maybe I just prefer Steve Crow as the office or as that in that type of comedy. Okay. Maybe I prefer that or like, I mean, I love him in Anchorman. Maybe <laughs> I maybe I that's what I prefer because I like. Did you watch Foxcatcher? Only bits and pieces. Yeah, uh, he, I didn't. Fox, he's. He's not the headline in Foxcatcher for me. I know he got nominated and that's fine, but right. there are a lot like Ruffalo's in that and even Channing Tatum. They're they're the brothers. They're they were more intriguing to me than the whole the the, the character that Carell played in, in, in Foxcatcher. He was just, also trying to be someone else. Well, he had a fake like, nose yeah. and yeah, it was it, it also felt very much like a movie like I'm serious. I'm a serious actor. And I'm sure that's not the intent, but that's what it felt like. Sure. Um, now, on the other hand, I actually love Ryan Gosling as Jacob. In this oh, he's film. so good as he's Jacob. really good. Like it's it's criminal how good he is. In this <laughs> film. Whether he just had a really tight grasp of the character, or he just knew it, or it's just that's just his natural charisma, charm. He's just fantastic in this film. He's got a lot of charm. He's like old school, but new school kind of like he's got that kind of like macho bravado but it's not like overblown Mm -hmm. he's also got some of the best lines in the entire film though i mean that doesn't hurt (laughs) (laughs) uh yes agreed he's got a lot of good stuff and and him and the stuff between him and cal are is great and especially when he's training him or when when he's trying to teach him how to be a ladies man as you will yep um that stuff is really good i mean we talked about it before the show about how the whole thing with the sneakers 
Oh yeah, Wait, yeah. Can, here's those New Balance. Let me see him. Yeah, and he just throws them off. I'm, one of the lines I liked when he's talking to Kyle, and he's like, "Like, uh, let's talk about how many women you've been with." He's like, "Sexually?" He's like, "No, I mean breakdance fighting." <laughs> <laughs> like stuff like that. That's funny. I always think of like every time I get a drink at the bar, you take straw in your mouth. Look at you stuck in a little schmaz. Like yeah. I always think about that now. Every time somebody gives me the little black straw in my drink, I'm just like, oh, I guess I'll drink in the ice cubes. Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, there's a comedian that does that bit too. But oh, yeah, really? like you can't be tough. And he's like, oh, "Get out of here!" And he's like. <laughs> I can't remember who the comedian is. I always remember that the scene when he's talking to him and he's in the sauna and he's just naked. Oh, and he's, and he's like, he's like he's the, yeah, is this but he's making you uncomfortable? <laughs> yes, uh, yes, it is. Are right, good because if it wasn't making you uncomfortable, the smile's been in your face for twenty minutes. If it wasn't making you free comfortable, <laughs> but, then we'd have break. But in that scene, I don't maybe not that scene, but when they're in the gym, so they I think that's out of order because they go to the he goes to the salon, gets his hair done, right? Yep. They they do the stuff at the night, uh, like you know the whole thing. Like, oh, just, I want you to sh- watch me, you know, hit on these women. Shout me, yeah. But then they cut back to a scene when they're in the the gym and they're still talking about it, and his hair is down again. So I think that they that was out of order. Oh, okay. So which is interesting. I'm, I don't know why they maybe they put that in like that. I don't know. Maybe why. just for like maybe what better with the beats. Maybe they wanted to to get into the the him hitting on women in front of Cal, showing him what's going on. That is possibly the meanest thing I've ever heard anyone say to me no this is <laughs> your wife cheated on you because you lost sight of who you are as a man a husband and probably a lover you're right no that that's the meanest thing <laughs> said to me. <laughs> now uh gosling and and corral together are very funny and even towards the end of the and even at the end of the film uh, let's get to all the characters before we get to the end but i i really love his moment at the end of that the whole thing where it's the reveal and all that stuff. I really love his moment. Um, and it just kind of goes to the bond that the two characters have. Oh, that even though they're fighting all of a sudden, right. uh, Hagen shows up or Hagen shows Lin- up. Lynn like, Hagen. Yeah. You're Lynn Hagen? Do you know what you pause my friend? Yeah, and he, he takes off the ring. ring. He just punches them. Yeah. <laughs> Which is great. And it's like, like I, yeah. I laughed out loud in the theater. Yeah. Because that, that was awesome. crazy. Like, oh, you're oh, okay. You're Lynn Hagen. You're David Lynn Hagen. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. And, I, and even when he tells him, uh, when Cal's like, no, break up with her. No, break up with her. Like, and he's yelling at him and he's, I don't want you with my daughter. I don't want you with my right. daughter. And he's, and he's, and even then, like, you can still see that um, Jacob is still trying to get Hannah to call him, help. You know, he's still, uh, he's understanding. Yeah. He, he, he still, he wants him as, as a friend. Cause, that's yeah. the thing is like, Cal knows who Jacob is and Jacob knows that Cal knows. Yeah. Which is why when Jacob sees that Cal's the dad, he's like freaking out. I'm having trouble. Anybody else right. in trouble? Either? I'm going to go upstairs and watch TV. Can I go up and watch TV with you? <laughs> well, what's great about that too is, is going back to what you were talking about with he, how he reveals to Hannah, his, his family and how his father Cal was is so like, nice. his dad. yeah, Cal, I think he wants Cal to be his father. Yeah. Right? Like that father figure, which is great, which is just a great, my dad, like my dad it, was weak. He had too many feelings and it just wasn't right. It wasn't his fault. Yeah. He was just, he was a nice guy. He was too nice of a guy. And my mother took advantage of that, that kind yeah. of stuff. Uh, yeah. I honestly would be okay with if they said, "Hey, we're, we did a sequel to this just to kind of see the, how the family dynamic goes." Because I would be curious to see what what happens. What life after. is like right. now? Yeah, sure. But yeah, no, it's 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 one of those films where when you meet everybody and you meet the characters and you live within their world for the two hours you're here, it's actually you 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 like you feel like oh this is I really like this I really like experiencing all this. Yeah. it was nothing didn't nothing felt phony, the exception of something. Nothing felt phony <laughs> or forced or just kind of. Oh, come on, you know, the Robbie stuff was a little too much at, at times. The Robbie stuff's a little too little Miss Sunshine for me. Uh, I guess he just so he's a little too he's just too much. He's too out of his. He's too, which I mean, they do make comments about like how he scares scares the shit out of me. Well, he's he so he's so yeah he it's in movies. It's always funny in movies how they always have care these kid characters that just are so old soulish they know everything they're right. so smart and they're so they put all their shit together and that's just not possible it's yeah. just not possible and the, robbie has a crush on their babysitter which is played by jessica but it, it, that stuff is just well robbie has a crush on his babysitter what? named jessica yeah no yeah <laughs> his babysitter jessica you said played by jessica oh whatever well what, what, <laughs> was this correcting me fine you continue the story you continue the podcast i'm finished i'm done <laughs> What we're talking about? I was exactly, <laughs> exactly. Maybe if you don't worry about correcting my grammar, Damn. you can talk about the movie. So Robbie's in love with his babysitter. I'm just trying to set that up. Like he's making grand gestures, are making her uncomfortable at how much, how in love with her he is. Uh, when really Jessica's in love with Cal. What? Right. That's what you you get. That she takes uh, 
there's so many storylines here. All right. So before we let's get into the Jessica cow storyline. So Robbie likes Jessica. Robbie, it likes his babysitter, Jessica, but Jessica is in love with the father. Cal. Cal has no idea. What does Jessica do about it? Uh, toward the end, she gets advice from another gold digging kind of <laughs> high school student. And she says, take naked pictures of yourself. Right. Cause then I'll have to take not a gold, she's not a gold digging. So she just dates older men. Yeah. I, my my note there is when she does the my lips are ur, 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 oh. and I go why didn't my lips are seals ever ever kick off lips why are seals all, why do we all do this <laughs> like why didn't this happen all the time why were people always doing this <laughs> so I thought that was interesting uh, yeah so she takes naked photos uh, father Claire and Bernie there her parents find them and then goes to go goes, kick Cal's goes ass. Yeah, kick, which I don't I was not a fan of Jessica's mom Claire be, played by Beth Littleford I thought she was like she was just bothered me she was too far you get these kind of real kind of people Mm -hmm. and she is so like that have their good sides and their bad sides and then she is just all kind of negative nosy well she's helen lovejoy from the simpsons essentially she's just like all banter all talk all hearsay kind of rumors Mm -hmm. and stuff and you gotta pick you gotta pick them we can only have one of one of their friends that whole thing yeah so come on when they when they 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 announce they're getting a divorce cal goes to the bar bernie meets him at the bar and bernie tells him you know bernie shows up with a gift I was just trying to get a gift. Hey, gets a drink, downs the drink, and then tells Cal that I can't be your friend anymore because my wife says I have to choose. I wanted to choose you, but she said we have to choose Emily. Yeah. And it's like, and then he leaves. So he stiffs you on the drink. So you had to pay that drink now. And he and he's too much. He can't. He's strong enough of a person to tell his wife, no, I, he is my friend. Yep. So every time he sees Bernie later on, I'm like, don't, don't talk to him. Like, I don't even want you to be his friend anymore. Like, even well, when she kind of doesn't, though, like when they're in Lowe's and he's just walking by, he, he walks, walks yeah. right past him. But at the end of the movie, like they kind of go to him and they're smiling. Oh, because the whole thing where uh, he makes that big speech at the end of right. the graduation. But I was like, no, you don't get you don't get a happy smile moment. You just suck. You yeah. Know? Like, you're so we should you don't deserve to be his friend. I was not a was not a fan of Claire, and then I was not a fan of Bernie just because of his, his you know weakness. It, his weakness of just not being able to be like no this isn't right where they're both our friends plus plus the fact I mean him going over to fight him is funny because he doesn't know what's happening you know they're getting all riled up because of the the, the, the dirty pictures yeah. that's fine but after that I don't want anything to do with Claire Bernie <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then at the, to wrap up the Robbie and Jessica stuff, which I don't get. So at the end of the movie, Robbie has a, is doing a speech because apparently he's the salutatorian yep. of the eighth grade class, which is not a thing. <laughs> and um, he and he talks about how he loves stinks and he hates them because throughout this whole movie, Robbie is talking about how much he is a, a lover, somebody who he believes in love, he believes, loves in, love. believes in true love, believes in there's one person left for everybody, their soulmates, all that stuff. So he's completely depressed because of everything that happened. And then Cal stops him, says no, and then he goes down. And Cal talks about how he still loves his wife and how he he relives, which is a nice story about he told how he went back and told his father that you know he met the girl. He lied to his family. The only time he lied to his father because he's like, oh, I'm gonna date tons of girls, but he knew that that was the girl he wanted to be with. And yep, so it was really nice. And then Robbie's like, oh, Jessica, and I was like, ah. but then after that, Jessica gives the pictures that she shot for Cal, the nude photos or the risque photos, yep. if, if you will. To Robbie, and she, I'm like, eh, only one. What? <laughs> what are we doing here? Like, this is a little. I mean, it's cute. I get it. Coming of age, but it reminded me of uh, the Sandlot, where the one character had a crush on the lifeguard, oh, the lifeguard, yeah. and they ended up uh, being together in the end. That's what it. That's what that reminded me of. But we didn't have to see that. Like this, the you know what I mean? That was kind of funny. It was. His it's a of, cute, of, it's a cute <clears throat> and he has like just a deep grunt after he sees it. I thought that was funny. It's a cute moment in this film, but if the gender roles were reversed and Jessica was a dude and Robbie was a woman, oh, a little girl, creepy. it would have been creepy. So there is that, but I don't want to be, I don't, I'm not trying to be that nitpicky person that way. I just, I just, I wanted to point that out a little bit. <laughs> what did you think of Emma Stone as Hannah? She's all right. She's yeah. good. She's got a nice personality. She's, you know, obviously like you can see like why he would fall for her. She's cute. She's real. She's real. She doesn't she calls him on his bullshit. It, it, absolutely. They have like their chemistry feels real, which is probably why they were a couple th- two other movies as well, La La Land and Gangster Squad. Well, they probably get along. Yeah. yeah. They just uh, it just felt like a real connection they had to each other mm-hmm. and they played off each other really well. So, I like that. Uh, I don't think she has enough to do. 
she's mostly there to be someone that Jacob could realistically fall in love with. But she herself, her plot line's a little weaker, right? In terms of just being with this milk toast kind of boring uh, lawyer. Yeah, who's such what a what a doofus. He's just such a such a dweeb. What a doofus! Like he like you don't just you know like there was a moment. Uh, I have the note here that you talked about that Jacob criticizes Cal for drinking through the straw. Yeah, and then when they go to the scene where Richard, which is her boyfriend, is toasting Hannah. All the guys are drinking oh, through straws. Drinking yeah, through straws. So I yeah, that I noticed that. <laughs> yeah, no, I I agree. She's uh, like this story is definitely Cal and Jacob, but Emily, who's uh, Cal's wife, played by Julianne Moore, has a bigger role. Oh, in she's this. got more to do. Yeah. yeah, she's got her own plot. Line she has well. one of the funniest lines in this film, and I can't, I couldn't stop laughing because I forgot about it. She's like. When she's telling Cal how she's unhappy and that she was like, remember when I told you I was whatever she was doing? I lied. I oh, went I to go see the Twilight movie by myself. I don't know why. It was so bad. <laughs> I, just, I couldn't <laughs> stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but she's she's really good in this. And you, it's not just a simple, like, I cheated on you. I don't want to be with you anymore. She's very confused and very upset and depressed she even says i think i might be going through a midlife crisis right. do women get midlife crisis because you only hear about men getting midlife crisis right um you know so and they have a cut they have a couple of really good scenes together where you where you know especially at the school when they have that blow up which they had that big fight in front of everybody in front of school and he, he basically unwittingly reveals that he's been with nine people yep but like it's in front of everybody and it's like i want to be like Mind your own business. Like, what are you? <laughs> what are you out here for? Like, all the parents like are just watching. All the parents are out there from the beginning, though. I, no, I they walk through the hallway and they follow them out because they're all in the lobby. Then they're outside, and then all of a sudden they turn. And everybody's outside. Like they came out after him because I know they came out after him because the Bernie and Claire were in Claire. Yeah, they were inside, and then all of a sudden they're outside watching. The them. inside or the, yes, in the atrium, were, the atrium kind of thing. Uh, they were inside because they, they definitely do follow them to the because they came though. out of the the classroom and they're arguing in the hallway where all the tables were. But the hallway is empty. Well, no, because then Marissa inside. Tomei comes out. Five years. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I just it's like mind your own business, mind your own business, <laughs> You're like that kind of stuff. It just was. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I wanted to, so I wanted to talk about the uh, the scene between Jacob and Hannah where they do the dirty dancing thing. Did you see this note? Because I never knew this note. Oh, I I had seen that note before. Yeah. Okay, I never knew this. So when they were rehearsing the scene, uh, where because uh, Hannah tells Jacob, "I want to know your move. What's your finishing move? Tell me your move. What what gets all the women?" He's like, "I do the yeah. scene in dirty dancing. I can do the when baby runs and he picks, lifts her up, he, lifts her up. He can do that." So she, she was like, oh, I want to do it. I want to do it. But like, so when they were shooting the scene, Stone, I guess, didn't realize she had a phobia of being lifted high up uh, until the first time he did it. And she had, I guess, had a meltdown. Uh, Gosling described it as like a possum falling out of a tree and trying to scratch your eyes out. And I guess she had to go. She had to go away. She lied down, down and watched Labyrinth to calm down. And I guess <laughs> she has a phobia came from when she was seven years old and fell off the high bars in gymnastics and broke both her arms. And so they ended up having to use a body double for the lift. Um, but I guess they used the recording of a real screen, the first <laughs> one, which is I'm like, that's we that's a weird note. It's just a weird like nugget uh, from this film that I just didn't expect to get. Yep. Don't lift Emma Stone. Because a lot of the facts for this film were not great in terms of what people had oh, compiled. It was like so and so was in this movie, so and so was in that movie. These people played brother and sister in this, but like these are not notes I care about. I don't yes, right. they have other jobs and they work in other perform and roles. I don't need to know all that. That doesn't help me with this film. <laughs> there are two <laughs> dated references in this film that when they happened, I was like, Ugh, I guess we know when this film was. Oh, I think I, I think Go I had one what of do you them. think there? Is one of them when uh, they when Robbie texts Jessica and says Ashton Kutcher, Kutcher yeah. and Demi Moore have 15 years yep. in between them, and they seem like they're doing all right. Yeah, that was dated. And then the other one was when he kind of shows up with the, with the turtle, like, or he took with the new balance. like, are you Steve Jobs? Well, hold on, hold on. Are you the creator of Apple Google computers? Computer? Yep, I saw Like, that was just like, ooh, okay. Although he's kind of like still in the zeitgeist, I guess. I got you. It's still dated. It's still dated. <laughs> uh, did you, so did you take away any inspiration from this film in terms of like when, uh, Jacob was trying to dress Cal like any kind because like, I did. I'll tell you right now, it was be better than the gap. <laughs> oh yeah. 
You're better than Gab. Say it. Say it. <laughs> I'm better than Gab. He's like, well, how much are these jeans? They're like, he says they're like $200. He's like, yeah, but it's like, let's just get them at the Gab. And he just leaves. It's like, be better than the Gab. And like, it's like, yeah, agreed. <laughs> yep. The, uh, the Velcro wallet. I've never had a Velcro wallet. But. Uh, I probably did when I was a kid, but I don't remember. I, I remember having one, but I don't remember it being like a significant member of my. Where are your wallets? <laughs> 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 and he's like offended when he first opens the wallet, and gives him his credit card. Uh, when he steps back yeah, and he's, he's like, just like, what, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> I love. And the scene, like, I, obviously, I already said the straw thing. And then also the uh, the tw- he gets the hair or he first gets dressed. And it's like, would you sleep with him? Oh, I'd sleep with him. And then he goes, what are you, what are you even saying? That's, that's stupid. That's ridiculous. What, what do you see what you did there? See, you ruined it. You ruined it. And, and now she's not going to sleep. And he stares at her. He's like, what, what is that? What do you, what do you see what you just did there? Yeah. Yeah, you're doubting yourself. And then but now she's doubting herself that she wants to sleep with you. Yep. <laughs> that works. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and you talk about um, the ending of the film where uh, the big reveal of Hannah being his daughter, but they also have the, they also do a good reveal of the Marissa Tomei being the teacher that he ends up sleeping with. Oh yeah. When she comes out, the first yeah. woman he picks up in the bar is her and he's, I'll call you, I'll call you, I'll call you. But then he, he doesn't, you don't realize that they're going to talk to Robbie's teacher who, where he, you, he says asshole like 80 times about love. And um, when they're talking about the Scarlet letter and then it's Marissa Tomei like oh and you know, so that was a good reveal too it was almost yep. like a hearkening of there's another reveal to come kind of thing you want a word asshole she writes on the board and starts flipping out I know I had to go down on you for 45 minutes because you were nervous <laughs> and your wife's like ew 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 <laughs> one of the other lines in this film I liked was when Cal is telling the story about doing his little speech at the end, cutting off his son. One of the lines I really liked was like, he's talking about his wife, Emily. He's like, I loved her. Even when I hated her, only married couples understand that one. I thought that was really good. That's a, that's a really like solid line like that. Mm. A lot of married couples would understand. And I think people who aren't married would, would get what Cal is saying. Sure. Cause you know, you're never going to hundred percent agree with everything that your wife does, but you're, you know, you're, that doesn't mean you're done. You know, you're in it for the long haul kind of gotcha. thing. You know, which I think is a really, really solid piece of writing. Like there's just sometimes in movies, in these movies that we talk about, there's just some lines that are so solid and you're just like, that's really well done. That's, and that, you know, and it's a good, and he delivered it well too. So yep. I always just, I always really like that line. There's so many good lines. Oh yeah. I love the line when, um, when Robbie has to go to uh, M's office with him because she got kicked out for saying the asshole thing. And he talks about, you know, I heard you crying. So I had to Google mom's crying. And I found a lot of videos. And do those parental controls work at all? Oh, they work for me, mom. They work for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my note for that is the parental controls never work. They n- I really, I love the parental control where they're like, just make sure that they go through the parental control. They have to go through the app, then go through the Google through the app. That, that's not going to work. No one's going to do that. They're not going to do that. It's, it's they don't work. They don't work. <laughs> it's a really strange kid. Yeah, he should. It's a losing sh- battle out there, parents. <laughs> <laughs> all their insults to Robbie are awesome. It's a really strange kid. Yeah, he scares the shit out of me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad we switched babies in the uh, nursery. And then, uh, God, I hate that haircut. I know. He looks like a sheepdog. <laughs> so I was thinking the same thing the whole movie. I'm like, cut your hair, dude. Or what is the line he tells? What is the line that Kel tells Jacob when he like he, he basically accepts? And he's like, I bought a firearm. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. I bought a gun from a really shady site. <laughs> <laughs> and then like Hannah's like, oh, this is going to be fun. He's like, oh, yeah. So I thought that was good. <laughs> yeah. Because like Hannah's always like in on the joke, like Hannah clearly has his her father's sense of humor kind of thing. Oh sure, yeah. You know, you get that she, you know, she's what's she's not phony. She's genuine, and she knows like she just knows the score. I guess that's probably the best thing to say. So let me give you some, as I like to do. Let me give you some reviews. See what you think. Owen Gleiberman of. Entertainment Weekly at the time, because I believe he's somewhere else now, called this nothing more or less than an enchanting light comedy of romantic confusion. It's a movie that understands love because it understands pain. Sure. (laughs) I mean, yeah, kind of. Christy Lemire at the Associated Press wrote that it never gets crazy or stupid enough to make you truly fall in love with it. I mean, like, that's like, I like, don't believe how that. Then do I do a line. You're looking for something stupid. You're right. looking for like the wingman. How do, but, but yeah, how do I do a line that incorporates the title of the movie and it'll make me seem like I'm hip? I'm uh, it's like, blurbs. just how about, yeah, how about Christy, just, how about you just write a review? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it never gets crazy or stupid enough. I mean, come on. How do you guys think of this? I got crazy stupid love in the first line. It's, it's dumb. 
And then James Rocky or Rochi, excuse me, I don't know if I said that wrong, of MSN Movies gave it one out of five stars, remarking that it's a star studded lump of fantasy and falsehood. Somebody has a bad family life. <laughs> yeah, that guy, uh, that guy doesn't know love, has never seen love, yeah. doesn't know what love is, is a very sad so name. Someone's a little uh, jaded. <laughs> 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 because those, those, those are out there. Those relationships are out there. And it's also a movie for crying out loud. I mean, what, 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 do, you, what do you want here? <laughs> I want to be alone <laughs> forever. Pretty much. Uh, would you recommend this to people? Like, um, or what, what casual film goers? Uh, uh, I think this really works for almost anybody. I think casual film goers, I think will like it. It's lighthearted. It's got a lot of great lines. Ryan Gosling's really good in it. Steve Carell's really good at it. Emma Stone, Julianne Moore. Uh, it's got a lot of good stuff in there. And the branching storylines, I'm sure you'll prefer maybe one over the other, but you'll find something in the storylines that you really like. And it's got enough comedy that I think guys would like it on a date night and enough actual feeling and emotion that, you know, the ladies will like it during date night as well. Yeah. but. This what's who's the attraction in this film? Gosling or Carell? Like who is coming to this film for Steve Carell? You're coming to it because Gosling's in it. I'm right. Sure. So Especially you're coming. You're, you're, right. Because the trailer just showed his shirtless like his right. that one five minute scene is like half the trailer. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why you're coming to the movie. That's why. That's the only reason. I mean that and you put some jokes in the trailers too. But yeah, I can't believe that this film is over ten years old. 2011 20 so yeah it's disgusting that's I that's that. i was like oh, i remember seeing this i remember working this show. did yeah that's right we did that i can't remember if i saw this in the theater or not i probably did i i, I it makes sense that i would have i just don't remember <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no i can't believe it's 10 years old so it'll be on like one of the tcm 10 year old things oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> anniversary performance of crazy stupid love <laughs> there's anything i missed that i did not talk about uh what are some of your favorite lines Oh, I mean, I've told most of them. Okay. Uh, I, I, I love the breakdance line. I love the twilight line. Um, I really like how it starts off with I want a divorce. Cause I just like that the inciting incident is you right know. then and there. I actually like the whole thing in the beginning because uh, uh, when they show the introduction of all the, the couples and their feet and they're all rubbing each other, which never happens, but they're all like caressing each other their own feet, like playing footsie, playing being right. flirty, and then you, it cuts it right to them. It's like New Balance sneakers and shit and nothing, no, nowhere near each other. <laughs> So I thought that I, I liked that. I uh, I enjoyed that um, kind of like difference in from the, from the rest of the movie. I like the scene when he realizes that he got Miyagi'd and he's like, he, he, he starts recounts it. everything that Jacob's supposed, like how you're supposed to talk. No, never always put the onus on her. Never put, you know, don't ask never. her if she wants to go home. You know, just tell her she's going to come home with me. Like that kind of stuff. I thought that was good. Then he still messes it up. Though. Yeah, of course. <laughs> boring, <was>. boring. <laughs> from an ex-alcoholic teacher, graduated from Oxford. Boring. <laughs> Well, when he does that, when he gets like that, do you think because he is basically Michael Scott, that, that, that's like an iconic role that will always he'll always be attached to? Do you think that that kind of bleeds into your psychosis when you're watching that and he starts? I think that's always going to be part of who he is, right, just part right. of what he finds funny. A lot of The Office is basically was him trying to find that character. Mm -hmm. You know, the very first season of The Office, he's David Brent. But well, they're all that, he, they're all copying. Yeah, yeah, he becomes his own like Michael Scott. So I think that's just kind of part of who he is right even in 40 year old virgin is very similar in terms of that that kind of shouty kind of awkward comedy that's kind of his shtick it's been so long since i've seen that that i think every time i catch 40 year old virgin i catch scenes that are, he's not in like i just catch like really quick and i right. never stay with it i just it's, it's been so long since i saw this film. i want that film i wonder if i would still like it as much as i did when i first watched it i don't know i also do that yeah, that's a that's a good question. This one, I'm glad that I still have uh, the same, you know, the same feeling about it. Like, I like it. I really like it. I I think it's a really strong script. A, a lot of the line we talked about a lot of lines. A lot of lines really work. The Robbie and Jessica stuff is probably if if you're having to push me on a weak spot, it's probably the only thing I found that like Robbie goes from cute to just over the top. Not not creepy in a way, but just really over the top. Just too much that you don't find it realistic. His right. scarlet letter announcement was too much. Right. That whole thing. And then he, he gets back to sincere, but we never meet like Robbie's friends. We never know what Robbie is. is how I was thinking the whole thing. Like is. he's always by himself. Right. Just so obsessed with the one girl. Mm -hmm. I'm, he's not going to give up my mom. 
my mom, just like I'm not going to stop sending Jessica text messages that make her feel uncomfortable. Right, right. <laughs> and they don't, I mean, I, I guess they have the youngest sister played by Joey King in there to throw you off that Robbie's not a only child, but also because who that's why Jessica is babysitting him. But she really doesn't serve any other purpose than that. Uh, the youngest oh, daughter. Yeah. yeah. She's there to throw you off from Hannah. I believe so. Yeah. 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 I agree. I, I thought that too. Yeah. And they, and again, that reveal is, I, I think works because you know, even though you watch it now, uh, back then you never expected it. You just didn't put two and two together. No. Yep. Cause they call her Nana. They like, they reference her. Yeah. And they go, Nana called. I talk to her. Yeah. How is she? She's worried about us, like always. Yeah. And you think Nana? Okay, it's his, it's his grandma or his mom or something like that. Right. And then Hannah Banana. Yeah, it turns out to be <laughs> Hannah because, like, you know, I couldn't say my name uh, Hannah when I was little, and she just like brushes it off. Right. Right. <laughs> what are you doing here? What, what are you doing <laughs> here? <laughs> but I like their scene too when they're uh, in the bar when Cal's. To, uh, you'll never get my permission. Right. When he's trying to tell him. You yeah. Know, I'm glad you're a better man. But I'll never give you my permission. Right. I taught her how to ride a bike. I taught her how to ride, drive a car. She's just too good. She's too good for you. And he's, and like, he's I like, I know. Yeah. And then he says before he leaves, because again, no hard feelings. You're a good father. Yeah. Because Jacob knows what it is. He understands why Cal wouldn't want right, somebody like right. him as his daughter. But, you know, but then obviously he comes around. And, and I, the idea at the end of the movie when Emily and uh, Cal are talking, they're laughing and Robbie's watching them. You get the idea that they're going to end up getting back together. Yeah. I mean, you're going to be you, all right. You get that sense throughout the movie. Just simply even the scene when she calls to pretend that she needs to put the pilot. Oh, well, that's out. a great scene. Yeah. And Cal is outside because Cal's been taking care of the, the, the garden, the, the, the garden, the, the garden, you know, at late at night because he just, he wants to take care of it. And he sees her in the window and she calls. She's like, I'm downstairs. And he starts walking her through it. He knows that she's just quiet. It's, it's a good moment. Um, the whole thing isn't that they fell out of love with each other. It's that he doesn't, he stopped fighting for her, which he right. says that somewhere along the line, he got boring. Right. And him trying to find, find that spark in him again. Mm -hmm. It's I, I think it goes to it's very easy in in, in marriage to just kind of like, oh, that's it. We're done. You know, Close by it. Right. Because, you know, listen, a lot of stuff happens. A lot of people just fall out of love. But sometimes there's, you know, this movie really deals with the fact that, you know, there's a reason why you were together. And, you know, even though you may have lost that, you know, it, marriage is hard. It's very hard. So I think this this kind of deals with that and and talks about how the struggles of probably a lot of married couples deal with maybe not to this extent in terms of like we're all sleeping around but well, yeah obviously it's a little heightened because it's a movie but yeah. sure sure but you know you do have those situations where you know you're with the same person for for however how long it, it, things that it happen school uh families uh, kids relationships just stuff you know you have to fight you have to fight to make it keep going right, right. absolutely and i think that that's i i, I like the fact it like Comparing this to This Is Us, since I know that they did this move, did This Is Us, I enjoy that this ends with a hopeful note rather than the the the, the kind of depressing. dour depressing note that This Is Us usually ends with. <laughs> so, I guess why would we say this is forgotten then? Um, because they made money. Like, why are we saying that? Not are we saying just not enough people talk about it? I think no one talks about it. I think that it doesn't get the respect it deserves. I think it kind of gets lumped into the romantic comedy genre or the romantic movie genre of just like hey it's just for date night it's not as respected as much as like it's not just a good date night movie which we i talked about how like i would recommend it for people for that it's legitimately a really good movie with really good themes really good acting really good writing really good like the way it's shot it just looks nice as well it's, it's just a really good well put together film it's like the argument or not the argument but it's like the comment that we usually say and i usually said everyone was like Casino Royale is a really good Bond film, but it's also a really good film. Yes. So it's not like there's a difference between like, oh, I like a really great Bond film. No, Casino Royale is a good film. It, it, it supersedes that just the fact that Bond is in it. Yeah. So I think of this, I agree with you. I think maybe people would watch this movie like, oh, it was cute. Oh, that was I like that film. But it's like, no, this is a really good, solid film. This is well written. This is well directed and well performed. And it, it has really, really great heartfelt moments that maybe people are just you just want people to take no 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 this is such a really good film of course not cut that take we come off as snobs that way but you know <laughs> yeah I, but i agree with you I, I i agree with that i agree with that assessment thank you 
<laughs> Where can they find us? You can find us at ForgottenCinemaPodcast.com or ForgottenEntertainment.com as we are part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. While you're there, check out all the other great podcasts and videos we do that are available to you guys to enjoy and consume. <laughs> <laughs> all right. uh, for our podcast, you can also find us wherever you get your podcasts, like I say at the beginning of the episode. Uh, while you're there, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It always helps to help our channel grow and get more listeners, and we can do more cool stuff the better we get. And you, the mentioned, we get. you mentioned the lobby. Uh, we are also on the lobby. Well, it's called Forgotten Cinemas Lobby. It's a Facebook group, so a lot of stuff we post in there. And you, we actually will, you know, if you want to ask about an episode, you want to suggest an episode, you want to talk about a movie we talked about, whatever. Talk about any movie you want to suggest a film that I should just watch. You know, that's where we do all that. So it's a it's a group you just got to join. Uh, you have to ask to join, but I let you in, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, check it out. Um, that's called it's called F- Forgotten Cinemas Lobby. You can actually find it through the Forgotten Cinema Facebook page. It's attached to that, of course. Uh, and then next week, we are going to 1980. We're going to watch the American musical comedy film Popeye. <laughs> Butler's got a face on him. He doesn't think his movie's good. I, you know, I've never actually seen the whole thing. I've only seen bits and pieces. Well, have you ever seen the end? What well, bits and pieces? The ending? Uh, the no. Pluto fight? Stuff in like a cave. And then like there's That's the ending. Water. Okay. So yes. Parts when of he's the end. He yeah. just did it. Yeah. yeah. It's good. I don't know. <laughs> I like it. Well, we're going to watch. That's <laughs> Robert Altman. Interesting. Robert Altman directed that. <laughs> And we got some good people behind that. Robin Williams is in that. Listen, I'll watch. I'm excited. I've never watched it. All, All right. So that's next week. We're doing Popeye. Uh, until then, have a great week. I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And this has been Forgotten Cinema. Hello, my name is Andrew Morgan. My name is Shane Beauregard. And my name is Chris Frodell. And together, we form like Voltron to make a brand new entertainment and pop culture podcast called Recent Activity. Every Wednesday, we will bring you deep dive reviews of the hottest titles from around the film and TV world, previews of the next big things to add to your watch list, or do fun things like top five lists, movie drafts, or anniversary celebrations of your favorite classic films. Subscribe now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Starting May the 11th.